as part of our journey series called Love Over Ego. The congregation is going to be looking at the book of Daniel. And today's reading from the word of the Lord is from chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, a story about Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic and said, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me until time has changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know if you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the story goes on to describe how Daniel, who is a Jewish captive in Babylon, learns of the king's demand, and he prays to the Lord to know the dream, and his prayer is answered. And the story continues. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has shown to you what will be. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, 
and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. And Daniel explains how the different components of that image represent a succession of different kingdoms. And then he says, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain. And its interpretation is sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is a God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand his dream, but clearly he knew that it was important. Most of our dreams we forget as soon as we wake up, or sometimes even before we wake up. Sometimes we remember our dreams, but only because they're so strange that they're funny to us. But sometimes dreams leave a powerful impression on us. We feel that they're full of meaning and that feeling lingers with us even if we have no ideas or explanations to attach to it. Dreams can be particularly poignant this way, but actually it's pretty normal for us to feel things that we don't understand. It's normal for us to run into hopes or memories or aspirations or expectations that are absolutely steeped in powerful feelings and yet not know what to make of these things. In the deeper spiritual sense, the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is about our struggle to understand some of the powerful things that rise up in us. And it's about us learning to recognize that we need to let some of those things go. In his dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw an image or a statue. The head of the image was of fine gold. Its chest was of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet of iron mixed with clay. Obviously, the statue pictures some kind of a descent. At the top, it's made of something really beautiful and precious. It's made of gold. But then each lower part of it is made of something less precious, until at the bottom, it's made of iron mixed with clay, which is not very attractive, and more significantly, not very useful. Iron and clay don't really stick to each other, so something that's built out of the two of them together is bound to just fall apart. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, a great stone was cut from the mountain without hands, 
and we read that it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. In the teachings of the new church, it says that this statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw represents the Lord's kingdom or the Lord's church, both on a grand scale and inside every person. And what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream describes a progression or a pattern that the Lord's people go through. On a grand scale, Nebuchadnezzar's dream is a sort of a spiritual history of the human race. A long time ago, there was a golden age when the Lord's church was in perfect integrity. And then there were a series of less and less perfect ages until at last there was a church with no integrity. And then it was time for that church to be undone and something new established in its place. Gold represents love to the Lord. Silver represents love that's still good but less humble. Bronze represents a still lower kind of love that has very little wisdom attached to it. Iron represents a church that's come to be so focused on truth that it's become cold and stern. And iron mixed with clay represents a church whose teachings have become so disconnected from the life of love that they've become two different things that won't stick to each other. And what the church calls good is no longer good at all. And the great stone represents the truth said that that stone was cut from the mountain without hands because no human hands have ever or will ever shape the truth. The truth is the Lord's word which stands forever. And in the presence of the truth, the falsities of a hypocritical church break and they blow away like chaff. And then something new can arise. That spiritual history is useful to know, and the teachings of the new church talk about it a lot. But really, more than a history, what Nebuchadnezzar's dream is showing us is a pattern. There's a golden age, and it's followed by a silver age, and so on down, until something that had seemed good is no longer good and it's time for something new to be made in its place. This is one of the most basic patterns in creation. Listen to this teaching from the work called Invitation to the New Church. The coming of the Lord accords with the order in which spring does not come until after the winter, nor the morning until after the night, nor comfort and joy to the woman in labor until after the pain, in which consolations are after temptations, and one lives truly after death, even as the Lord says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The Lord showed the basic pattern of this order when he suffered himself to be crucified and die and afterwards rose again. This also is involved in the image which appeared to Nebuchadnezzar in that the stone became a great rock at the last. It's likewise involved in the four ages known to the ancients, the golden, the silver, the copper, and the iron ages and also in the ages of every person from infancy to old age. Then is the end of the life of the body, and then comes the life of the spirit, 
which is the life of all who have lived well. Morning becomes evening and then night and then there's a morning again. The golden age is corrupted and it becomes no more than crumbling iron and clay and then something new is created. This is the pattern of the Lord's order. If we let the Lord work in our lives, then we'll see this pattern in ourselves. And the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is about us coming to understand this. Nebuchadnezzar himself represents something that's pretty corrupt, something that's pretty tyrannical and selfish, and it's not really hard to see why. Imagine having the gall to say to a room full of your advisors, I've had a dream. I won't tell you what it was. You tell me what I dreamed and tell me what it means, or you'll be cut in pieces and your houses will be made an ash heap. It's almost amusing to hear the wise men trying to find a diplomatic way to tell the king that he's being absurd. But even though he was being profoundly unreasonable, Nebuchadnezzar probably was wise to distrust his wise men. They were very learned and clever people, and they were probably extremely good at making stuff up. And he knew that. He said that you've agreed to speak to me lying and corrupt words until time has changed. He expected lies from them, so he wanted some sort of proof from them that they had real insight to offer him. Nebuchadnezzar represents selfishness or, or self-orientation, which kind of by default will rear up and try to act as king within us. And all those wise men of Babylon, the magicians and the astrologers and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans, represent ideas that pander to selfishness. They represent the stories that we invent and the half-truths that we collect and surround ourselves with to justify selfish behavior. Nebuchadnezzar represents something that's not good, but the thing he gets right in this story is that he doesn't trust his advisors. He knows that they'll lie to him. In terms of our lives, this story is about selfish things in us claiming the throne when they shouldn't. But it's also about us beginning to recognize that we're dissatisfied with the old lies, as it were. The story that we've put together about why we should be the way we are is starting to feel hollow to us and we want something new. And so even though selfishness is still claiming the throne, we give the truth a chance. Nebuchadnezzar was willing to let Daniel speak. Daniel's name means God is my judge. So Daniel represents a part of us that is willing to say, God will be the judge of this. I don't know, but he does. And I'll abide by what he says. When Daniel speaks before Nebuchadnezzar the truth, the truth hidden within the king's dream becomes clear. Something good has been corrupted. What we perhaps still think of as golden has become iron and clay, and those corrupted things need to go. It's time for the truth to break those corrupted things and create something new. In terms of life as we experience it, Nebuchadnezzar's dream has two implications, one of which is reassuring and the other of which is a little more challenging to hear. The reassuring part of the message is that these cycles happen and they're cycles, not long, irreversible declines. 
nighttime would be really depressing, even crushing, if we didn't know that there was a morning coming afterwards. The Lord leads us into and out of low states. And so just because we find ourselves in a low state doesn't mean that we're doomed to stay stuck there. The Lord doesn't want that. Our nighttime states or our winter states or the states in which Nebuchadnezzar is king serve a purpose. And their purpose is that we recognize them for what they are and see that they don't make us happy. And when we realize that selfishness is dissatisfying and that all of those things that we've collected to justify selfish behavior are not our friends but our enemies, then we get to look up. Rising up is part of the pattern. And each new beginning is better than the one before. And what's bright and new now won't stay golden forever. Low times will come again. And that's okay. This pattern is the Lord's pattern. He's got this. In his word, he tells us, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. The more challenging part of the message is represented by the moment in which the great stone meets the feet of iron and clay. The feet of the statue were crushed by the stone. In fact, every part of the statue was crushed. And we're be told that they became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. It's not hard to see that this represents something in us, some thought or something we've clung to, some idol or illusion that we've cherished, getting broken by the truth. Sometimes it feels like the truth strikes us with great force, and we don't always like the result, especially not at first. The hard part is that what gets broken feels to us like it's made of gold. We have an image of ourselves, some idea of who we'll be or who we are or what we're good at or the way life will go, and it feels good. It's precious to us. It's steeped in powerful feelings. Maybe it has its origins in the things that we believed about ourselves when we were children. And maybe our memories and impressions of the innocence of childhood give this image a kind of a golden glow. The truth is that the image has feet of iron and clay. It felt good once or seemed precious once, but it's gotten mixed up in things that are selfish and in things that aren't true. So our image isn't what we felt it was. Maybe that means that we won't sail through life through our marriages, through parenthood, through our careers, like we thought we would. Maybe it means that we're not so good at something that we've taken a lot of pride in. Maybe it means that we catch ourselves being selfish, like Nebuchadnezzar, and we just can't deny that we're imperfect. These are hard realizations. The truth breaks our illusions and they blow away like chaff. There's an emptiness that follows when the idol falls. But that emptiness is the emptiness of a field at the end of winter. A field waiting for spring and new seeds. 
when we let the Lord's truth speak within us, we may hear him saying that something has to go. Something has to die. He himself told us, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Sometimes letting go of something that's not true feels like dying. But that death is not the whole picture. We go through our lives, through our cycles of night and day, and sometimes the path that the Lord lays out feels easy, and sometimes it feels hard. And all the while, He is working in secret. All the while, he is planting seeds in the earth. And they grow whether we see them or not, whether it's night or whether it's day. And when the morning comes, and it will always come, we get to look up and see what our Lord has caused to grow within us even while we thought that we were empty. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seeds on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seeds should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth bears fruit of its own accord. Amen.